All right, welcome back, everyone. Today, I'm going to do um, I'm going to do some information on gravity and physics, and we're going to talk about the electric universe and why the model of the electric universe is much more accurate than mainstream science and mainstream academic circles have been um, teaching for the last well hundred years or so. I'm going to be quoting, um, be reading from the book "Gravity Is a Myth and Does Not Exist" by Robert Otey, and I had the uh, the great fortune of, of talking with Robert quite extensively and interviewing him on a podcast. And after studying his work and the people that he built his work upon, I uh, felt like presenting this information because it's um, such a paradigm shift and so important for people to know. And at the very least, just think about, just contemplate that what we're what we've been taught in schools in the modern era about the way our solar system works and the universe at large could in fact be totally false. So here we go. I'm going to be reading from the book Gravity is a Myth and Does Not Exist by Robert Ote. First of all, Newton's gravity was an inward pulling force, which was due to the amount of mass it had. The greater the mass, the stronger the gravity, and therefore the stronger the pull. This fallacy was created by Newton when he added in a purely ad hoc manner to the product of two masses by Kepler's orbital equations, thereby forcing the interpretation that mass creates gravity. Pari Spolter has proved in her work that Newton was wrong and that adding masses to the equation in fact produces invalid results in the range of magnitudes which are exponentially off. When Kepler's orbital equation is used for the same motions, the sums of the sums all tally up to be the same, proving Newton was wrong when he added the mass to his gravity formulas and that mass does not create gravity since gravity does not exist. Okay, so I'm going to pause here and kind of like just sort of rephrase what, what that means. What it means is that Kepler's three laws of motion on planetary motion were done by mathematical observations, um, observing nature as it is and observing the stars and observing the planets as they happen and doing mathematical equations. And what what they're saying is that Newton added to that equation the product of mass. So he added a new element to that equation. And when he did that, he was incorrect. And so basically what we call gravity or what gravity, uh, that, that term was invented by Newton, is actually not gravity at all. It's a product of electricity. So Robert Ote has gone and explained that the universe is electrical in nature and that gravity is not a force and that the only force that actually does exist in the universe is electricity. So moving on. I contend here that mass has nothing to do with gravity. So-called gravity does not exist. Walter Russell redefined gravity as points and shafts of the creator's still magnetic light, which is omnipresent meaning that it is points and shafts of stillness and not a force at all. In my honest opinion, it would have to be, it would have to have been better for Dr. Russell to have taken the tact and eliminate the term gravity altogether rather than try to redefine the cursed term. Reason being that the language confuses people greatly. This is the reason I'm going to record at this time to redefine gravity as non-existent. Okay, so this language is tough, but I'm going to do a drawing here to talk about points and shafts and how electricity and the electrical model of the universe actually makes much more sense when we look at nature. The motions of nature move in spheres and rings, and all bodies seem to move in spiraling, corkscrewing arcs. So the planetary motions that we've been taught by Newton and Copernicus and 
even Einstein, are incorrect. They're sort of a limited 2D dimension, dimensional approach to the, the movements that we actually see by real observation in nature. And the most common number to see that is the phi ratio, 1.618, which shows that the most common building block in structures in nature is this spiral, 1.618 ratio, constantly arcing, constantly curving. And it looks like this. <coughs> so what we see here is spiraling vortexes of electric current. So these spirals represent electricity because light moves in waves and so does the growth of, of all manifestation moves in waves. So the electrical current that we see, which we could call light or manifestation, moves in spiraling vortexes, imploding, always nestling inward towards its center. And one side of the spiral is male and the other side is female. They're called twin opposing vortices. And they actually seek each other. They seek to mate, so to speak, or they seek balance or they seek equilibrium, which is right in the center of this, which is actually not a point at all. There's no, there's nothing in the center there. There's no matter in the center there. There's actually a place of stillness. And electrical current is always looking for stillness, rest, or equilibrium. All things in nature are looking for equilibrium. And so when we talk about gravity, when, when we see things fall, like a rock falls to the ground, people go, well, that's gravity. But what, what that actually is, is not a force at all. It's not gravity. It's not two masses being attracted to each other based on their mass. That's what Newton said. And Einstein followed that up. What's actually happening is, is there's a shaft of like a, like the eye of a storm in the tornado. There's a shaft of stillness that runs right through the middle of these vortices. And it's totally still. It's actual stillness. So as electric current spins around itself, it creates like the eye of the eye of the storm. It creates a shaft of stillness and all electric current is seeking that center or seeking that stillness. So when objects fall towards each other, like a rock falling towards earth, it's one object's electric vortex, the way it's wound up seeking rest or equilibrium in its closest, nearest equipotential which would be the earth in this case. So if a rock falls to earth, the earth is electric, it's two spinning vortices, male, female, keeping the whole thing in manifestation, spinning what we call 3D, dense matter. And the rock is the same thing. It's 3D and it's actually seeking rest based on its center stillness, seeking rest in the earth's center stillness. And so all things are actually moving towards each other based on their electric equipotential or their greatest chance for stillness or rest. And this is what we see if we look at nature. All manifestation appears to come out of darkness, come out of nothingness, which is actually stillness. And then it comes into manifestation. It forms a body at whatever density, it could be a gas body, a liquid body, or a, a full matter body. And eventually that body gets dissolved like our bodies do and they turn to dust and they actually just go back into where they came from, which we would call darkness, but it's actually not darkness. It's stillness, which in Rossellian science is still magnetic light. Now that light being magnetic is still and it appears to us as darkness, but just because we don't see it with our senses as colored light doesn't mean it's not light. So it's actually still magnetic light. Now this square right here is representing the, the three planes of existence, material existence. You have this diagonal direction, you have north and south, and you have east and west, which would be the equatorial plane. 
And this is this square is actually a, just a model, a representation of magnetic space magnetic geometries, which are true. They do exist. We just don't get to see them in the physical form. They are magnetic geometries like any other geometry. They build form. But this form is what we see all bodies are built on, like all objects, like say a planet. Uh, it has a north and a south. It also has an equatorial plane, an east and a west. And it also has a, a spatial or volume plane. So this would be like one dimension, two dimension, three dimension. This is how dimensions are formed through geometric shapes. So this is uh, what Walter Russell calls the cubic waveform model. So even though this is a cube, it's it's actually a square that's constantly trying to become a circle or a sphere, and a sphere being uh, being formed at the base by these directions, which is actually a square. I know that's kind of abstract, but the point is is that electricity moves in waves, and the waves are not two-dimensional like this. It's actually a corkscrewing process like this. So when electric current moves down a wire, down the center of the wire, most people think it goes right down the center. It doesn't. It actually travels down the outsides of the wire and spirals the length of the wire. So at the very center of this is stillness. There's always going to be this sort of this, this stillness at the center of everything. That stillness is light. It's called still magnetic light. And this is what the electric universe model is based on. It makes much more sense. It's based on nature. It's based on the, the phi ratio. It's based on sacred geometry. It's based on the geometries we see and can actually observe with our real eyes and test with our real eyes and our real hands. So unlike Einstein's theories, they are theories that exist inside your mind and they're called armchair theories. And they, they add a lot of elements to them like like a man, you know, wearing a watch uh, up in space, which we cannot actually observe with our eyes. You cannot, you cannot measure that. You can't actually go and do that. So these theories exist inside the minds of modern day academic science, whereas the electric universe is something you can actually test with electricity, with electron guns and so forth, with light, with, with waves in general. Okay, reading on. It is much better to explain that actions and processes attributed to gravity in terms of the sole working force of the universe, electricity, than to continue trying to support a term which literally means nothing. So, electric potential centered by magnetic stillness is wrongly called gravity, since this is the sole force which creates the illusion of inward pulling force. A meteor, for example, is a dense piece of highly charged material which is seeking its proper equipotential condition in its course through our solar system. The electric potential of the Earth is also very high, so the meteor will mate, which is what we so-called attraction, with the Earth's electric condition. And it'll move inward towards the center of the Earth where it would seek rest when it passes near our planet, only to find it on the Earth's surface or consumed by fire on its entry to our atmosphere. Okay, so just reiterating, this is how objects appear to fall or be attracted to each other. They don't actually have a force called gravity attracting them. There's uh, an actual, their movements are actually not attractive. They're actually mutually repulsive. And uh, I'll explain that in a minute when we talk about the planets and how they, how they move. Um, but the point is, is that they're wound up electrical coils, so to speak, and they're wound up at different rates of electrical voltage. And in the center of them is stillness, and the stillness is constantly seeking rest throughout the universe, no matter where it appears in its original source, which is still magnetic light. All right, moving on. The creator controls all electric motions from within and without using magnetic cubes of space. Okay, so that was that square that I drew. It's called a cube, the, the cubic waveform. And that cube is basically a, 
a magnetic space geometric form or a magnetic space geometry. The cubes are centered by a point of still magnetic light and all the faces of the cube are cathode planes of still magnetic light which act as mirrors to transfer the motions of electricity from wave field to wave field of space while simultaneously reflecting them inward back to the source. Okay, so what he's saying is is those I drew that cube there, those you know, that's a square with 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 cathode planes and um, anodes at the end of those and they actually um, move electrical waves down them at such a rate to where they, they bounce off each other and they reflect and they actually move and, and create dimensions create what we would call volume and eventually you know objects manifest out of this electric light and it might look like a square it might look like a whatever the form it takes it's going to be based on this geometry of uh, a wave field, a cubic wave field. And continuing on, so-called gravity has been located at this point at the center of the cube sphere system. That point is extended into a series of points which become a shaft of magnetic stillness about which a sphere or ring system rotates and creates two opposing hemispheres in the process. So this is what those hemispheres look like. They're twin opposing vortices that outwardly they appear to get larger, which they actually do. They expand, spiraling, expand. And then um, inwardly they get smaller and they they are both attracted to their 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 center, which is stillness. And this is how things continue to go on and on and on and on. Male, female, twin opposing vortices. And this is actually like encapsulated in esoteric terms by the, uh, you know, the yin yang symbol, which everybody has seen. This is actually male, female, light, dark, spinning around itself. And this is actually a two dimensional drawing, obviously, but imagine it as a sphere, three dimensional. And what's actually happening is that the male, female, and the light, dark cannot exist without its center, which is stillness, which is actually, you know, basically the eye of the storm, the shaft in the middle. And it's kind of like thinking about it like this. Scientists are always looking at objects like planets and stars, and they're studying them, and they're going, wow, where do these things come from, and what, what powers them? And instead of studying the stars themselves, what they should be studying is the space between them. And this cubic waveform here is actually a model that shows how space, how, how geometry, space geometries actually create form, real form, three-dimensional form. And so instead of studying the, the lights in the sky, we should study the space that's in between them because the space is not empty. It's full. And that's the problem is in Newtonian physics and in, in you know Einstein's theories, space is mostly empty. And we actually, we find in the electric universe that space is actually not empty. It's full of electric lines of, of electric lines of magnetic, still magnetic light. All right, moving on. The series of points is not a force. It is just conditions of magnetic rest around which electricity moves in spirals. The still points control the pol polarization of a cube sphere ring system by extension into shaft divided by two hemispheres. These sex divided conditions are extended as far from each other as possible and mark the extremes which mankind has falsely called magnetic poles. These are sexed poles and are opposites. They are not magnetic poles nor are they created by non-existent force the non-existent force called gravity. They are absolute magnetic stillness around which electric motion spin. Okay. So the way in which I would explain this is those shafts. Um, again, now I'm going to kind of jump into a different dimension here and I'm going to just kind of do a different drawing. I'm going to jump into what most people think a photon, an atom, or a particle kind of is. And I'm just going to go through this quickly. Photons, by 
definition have no mass and no volume. So this is what light is made of, right? Well, they say that light is made of both a particle and a wave in the Newtonian Einsteinian view, but this is actually not possible. Light is not made up of particles. So the way that, that Walter Russell would draw this is they would say, if you were going to draw a photon or, or a, a unit, a quantized unit of light, you would obviously draw a circle. And that circle is moving through space and it's undulating and it just keeps moving and it keeps moving and it keeps undulating up and down. And Walter Russell noticed that these photons tend to move in a wave. And so we said, oh, these must be a bunch of particles just locating and relocating through intelligent information. But why do they take this wave pattern? Well, the reason why it appears that way is because our view is wrong, our concept is wrong. These are not multiple particles strung together. These are simply electric currents, electric waves. So you'd want to actually draw this in, in, in a wave, you know, like this. But this is actually still two-dimensional. The way in which waves work are spirals. So this is actually a corkscrewing wave like that. And so when it comes to our planetary system, it's the same. Uh, we're taught that, at least when I was a kid, we were taught that the sun sits still and the planets revolve around it like a pancake and that gravity bends light. Um, but it's actually not gravity that's bending light and it does. the sun is not stationary. The sun is moving. So I'll go here and read this. Um, the process of starlight bending is an electric process, not a gravitational one. The light bends near the sun due to its electric and atmospheric lenses, not due to gravity pulling on it. Electricity is the force which can bend light, since so-called light is electric and has no mass to pull on or warp according to the dysfunctional academic theories. It is claimed that magnets bend light as well like in mass spectrometry. However, the force is so-called magnets is actually electric and not magnetic force since electricity is the only force in the universe. So we're getting into magnetism. What he's saying is that magnetic light is still, it's stillness and it's the electric currents, the electric universe that we're seeing that's creating polarity. So real quick, basically you have a planet and at its center is uh, stillness and, and then it creates shafts and vortices that move outward. But they're, they're actually moving inward. They're all, all, all the motion of electric current is actually moving inward at the poles like this. And then every now and then when things get just right, it will spit out bodies of energy at the equator. Uh, that's a pretty bad drawing, but you get the point. And so it's constantly seeking its center, its rest. And this whole idea of a, of a body is just a shell, so to speak, that's spinning through with electric current so fast that it creates a balance or creates an equilibrium. And since space is cold, that form gets frozen, so to speak, or gets gets into it gets animated and held in animation until it unwinds or finds its time to, you know, sort of its entropy, it's time to die. And, the, and then it'll go back into stillness. So the point is, is that every body that we've ever found knows what, what basically is oriented north and south, east and west. So, so for some reason, all bodies, all planets, all people have a have a head and a and a and a foot, have a top and a bottom, and they just know which way is up and which way is down. So, hopefully, this sort of opens the door for people to think about the electric universe, and that light is actually traveling in spirals, and those spirals um, rotate at a certain certain rate. And they rotate so fast that they, they appear to be solid. They become dense, you know, so to speak. 
But what's at, the, what's at the core of those is not actually a point. It's not a proton. It's not an electron. It's not a neutron. It's not an atom. And if, if you want to study atoms, you can look at uh, D.B. Larson's book, um, A Case Against a Nuclear Atom, where he basically talks about this and explains that what we perceive to be an atom is actually just electric waveforms folding over each other in certain places to where they appear to be quantized chunks or they appear to be whole they appear to be bodies but they're not they're just folded in and then at certain times they fold out and disappear and we can sort of see this with the idea of photons and the double slit experiment they say is uh, you know photons are both light and waves at the same time but they're not because an electron gun which supposedly shoots photons as a particle or I'm sorry supposedly shoots electrons is not actually shooting an electron it's shooting an electric current shooting electric light is shooting an electric wave spiraling like this and so you could break up this wave if you want as many times as you want and you could just say oh well, this little chunk is a particle and this little chunk is a particle and this little chunk is a particle and this chunk is a particle and this chunk's a particle, and, and that's the way they're approaching it. But in, in actuality, what's happening is, is this thing is not broken up. It is electric waves of light, and there is no particle involved. So hopefully that, that, that helps you to understand that no one's actually ever seen an electron. No one's actually ever been able to isolate an electron from the nucleus of an atom because, well... The nucleus of an atom doesn't exist, an atom doesn't exist, and an electron doesn't exist. So they're basically just, they're using, you know, academic language to say, oh, we've isolated this electron. But the tools that they're using, if you're going to actually look at what's happening, is, uh, is, is shooting an electric current of light. It's shooting a beam of light, you know, and beams move and light moves in waves. So they're not actually shooting particles. So hopefully that helps. Um, I highly recommend looking into D.B. Larson, um, looking into uh, Robert O'Tay's book, which is amazing. It's only $7.77. and can get it online at his website, um, which is uh, freeenergyandfreethinking.com. Um, well worth it if you really want to take a look at this. He's done a great job of, of debunking a lot of the... Um, actually all of the Newtonian and Einsteinian pillars of quantum physics, at least quantum mechanics, and showing where they're, they're falling short or actually don't even exist at all. So it's time for a new approach to the universe. It's time to look at things um, as nature is presenting them to us, not as we are projecting them onto nature. Okay, feel free to comment. Feel free to share. Um, thanks for listening.